Hello, 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 hello. Wow, that was loud. Uh, hello, 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 hello. Live audio testing. Live one, two. Hello and welcome to five of the week. After having zeros for the past two weeks, we're back with at least five. This week, uh, we, as in me and uh, Nepto. How are you doing, Nepto? I'm doing great. Happy New Year to everyone, especially you. I mean, wow. it's been snowed as hell. Snowy Especially as hell me. in Finland. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But I didn't go out, so. Not a bother. Not a bother. Yeah. I mean, Happy it's, New it's Year. To Central everyone. Europe was warm as hell, and you guys in the Nordic countries froze to death. So. No, it wasn't too cold. It was just snowing. Anyways. That's cold for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's cold enough to snow, then it's probably cold enough. Yeah, it makes sense. Anyways, uh, where we last uh, dropped off in the previous episode uh, was we were doing the SBA Hall of Fame ballot nominees, and uh, we finished up with Valentino Khan Freedom, and uh, are now moving on to the rest of the players, the gooder, 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 the better players such as Baby Shark and uh, Yabba Dabba Doo. Uh, anyways, uh, not to discredit Baby Shark, but most everyone would agree that the main event is at the bottom here. Uh, before we get to Baby Shark though, first up is Kichiro Maeda. Uh, 10 years in the SBA, 6 with the Colorado Chiefs, 2 with the Oklahoma City Rampage, and 2 with the St. Louis Battalion, and also the user behind the player is here with us today. So, uh, I've talked about Maeda in private a lot more than anyone's ever heard me talk about in public, but um, I forgot that in the first seasons of his career, Maeda actually only averaged like um, a cool 10.6 points per game in his first three seasons. Uh, this is uh, not what he came to be known as, as a solid 20 and 10 player throughout his career. Uh, maybe uh, a little underrated in his last two seasons in Colorado, Colorado and uh, deserved a lot better. But then in the battalion seasons and <clears throat> maybe the prime season in Oklahoma City, maybe a little overrated, but still... Uh, compared to his time and the players, other point guards of the time, still an excellent, excellent player. Uh, I would say the best career year uh, was perhaps even in Colorado with 24 points, um, 7 rebounds, 10.5 assists, a massive 1.7 blocks for a point guard slash shooting guard, uh, 2.8 steals, excellent efficiency, across the board and a career low, at least a prime starter low in, well, I suppose it's a high, the word, anyways, in assist to turnover ratio with 10.5 assists to 3.9 assists. Uh, I would guess, in your opinion, your best year came, though, in Oklahoma City, but what do you think about your career in general and then Afterwards, we can maybe discuss what you think as of as your best year in the SBA. As you pointed out, he sucked at scoring early on, and that was exactly what he was supposed to do. So, as a first gen player, I was like, I, I want to model this player after myself, and truth be told, uh, beside a bit of three point shooting, I'm not the greatest scorer on earth. Um, but what Maeda could do as well uh, is defending and dish out some assists. And that was basically his whole thing early on. Until, until I realized, hey, I'm racking up so much t TPE, I don't have anything to spend it on. At least not uh, nothing to spend it on that's worth it. So I dipped into the offensive side somewhere. I think the fourth or fifth season it was. And from there on out, uh, he improved dramatically spent maybe a bit too many years in, on Colorado trying to get that team back up to 
I think three GMs, a tampering scandal involving one of them, uh, uh, many, many trades. And in the end, we made one playoff, which was great. Uh, but after that, his time was up and I demanded a trade, more or less. Yes, I demanded a trade. That's nothing around then and ended up in OKC with two great seasons and then famously tried to get everything point got of the year and the chip in my regression seasons and I got fever. So, <laughs> um, but still pretty successful seasons in St. Louis. I mean, we won 60 something games over years. Uh, if only the Ravens wouldn't exist, uh, maybe even a chip, but it shouldn't be. So overall, I'm, I'm quite pleased with how he turned out. Maybe a bit more accolades would just be nice in the end, but still a good career. Yeah. Now, I suspect that in the season 54 playoffs, the battalion would have lost to, if not the Vice, then either of the Rail or the Wolverines anyways, but the points to stands had to face the Houston Ravens plenty of times in your career, as most of us do in the playoffs. Um, uh, what do you think about the comparison between your final year in Colorado and then the prime year in Oak, uh, Oklahoma City? Uh, it, it's interesting because it's two quite different teams. I mean, in Colorado, if my memory serves me right, that must have been the year with I think it even already was Kelly Funky Congo in his last season after he was regressed. Alex Uzuambe. Yes. Also in a regress status. So a lot of passers. And um, Maeda sort of became the go to guy in his sixth season. And it was a great season. I had a lot of fun. Unfortunately, it also was the season of Trey Zonley and Sebastian Steele at Shooting Lot as well. They both had great seasons as well. We were pretty close, and I missed out by I think three voting points on the second team and five points on the first team, something like that. So it was a tight race, um, but you don't get participation trophies. Yeah, I think defensively, it's by far his best season. After all, I think that's pretty non non negotiable. Um, in OKC, it was sort of like the second to third option, a lot of trash. And maybe if you would want to count him, Brand to also put up 30 points per game. Um, I didn't expect him to win an award that season going into it. I thought Bojack had that on lock and actually had asked the team if it would be all right if I would switch to shooting up like after 30 games to get my first All Star appearance at Concord and then try to shoot for shooting out of the year. But in the end, I st ended up staying at point guard and uh, won it. And it felt great to finally get some recognition. But as Kelsey will tell you, um, let me win an award and I will leave you right afterwards. So I don't know if he's happy with that. And yeah. Well, the awards are, um, for at least for me, we've talked about this plenty of time, not the end all. Uh, for everything uh what would you say like uh, i'm interested to hear in your opinion on this but what would you say made uh, maeda a a great player uh, i have a pretty solid idea of this but i'd like to hear yours first um i would say it was defense even though it may have been a mistake to go to 80 block this early in his career, and uh, maybe 80, 80 blocking would be sufficient even for the whole career. Um, but I loved his defense. I loved what he always provided on that end. And in the end, he also was a decent playmaker, just never was the sole assist, yeah, assist collector on a team. It's what always like two or three more guys um, on the team that would pass the ball, so he never got into like the 12 assists per game territory, but still managed to get double digit assists in almost every season. And I think that's the major points. In the end, of course, it was the athletics that made him a, a two-way force in his prime, but I would say the defense and the assists were the major, major parts of him. 
Yeah, uh, I would say most of the what you said there comes as expected to most players, uh, except that you uh, ramped it up to 10 instead of 7.5, where uh, most SBA players sort of seem to quit investment these days. But uh, for me, the answer would be the like one of the best shot profiles and mixes uh, of uh, all players I've seen. Like uh, something I would like to emulate, uh, where uh, let's see for the career averages, um, six point one inside attempts per game, only two point one jump shot attempts per game, and a five point four three point attempts per game. Uh, for a six two player, making any sort of um, jump shots usually seems like a pretty difficult task which we talked about previously with Serrano and Walker Santos. But inside makes are a lot easier, even though it maybe wouldn't make sense. But nah, anyways, we'll go with that. Uh, and in the one season where, uh, or I guess there's a two more seasons. I was just looking at the season 52 season in OKC where the jump shot at times went up to 2.7 the percentage was still around or it was 390 which is good you know but then there's also season 53 where the jump shot attempts were even higher and the percentage was 330 but compared say uh, the jump shot attempts even in regression were lower than your free throw attempts and while Maeda was never a prolific free throw shooter 75.1 percent for his career it's still better having those shots than uh, the jump shots so th this is like that was an underrated aspect i thought for a long time uh, let's just pick a random comparison um who would be a and short could... point guard who only played uh, point guard and shooting guard bojack wasn't really short but he might be a, a good comparison of a different type of point guard. Yeah, well, at least um, Bojack is from, from the. the yeah, at least Bojack is from a similar time. Um, yeah, for Bojack, uh, peanut butter, uh, more jump shot attempts per game than free throws attempted per game through his career. And um, 6.3 inside attempts, 4.1 jump shot attempts and 5.1 three-point attempts per game so compare that to the what was it 10 3 and 6 of Maeda uh, it's an excellent way to improve efficiency and uh, uh, like you said you were originally just a more of a defensive playmaker and if you have the not to say perfect, but uh, as optimal of a shooting profile as you can have, then even when the possessions go to, so to speak, waste, uh, whereas your power forward or center is not getting their shots, then it's still the best shots you could have from your point guard or shooting guard position with Maeda, which is a big underrated aspect to me. Which yeah, made think... him very good offensively to complement the excellent defense. He became quite quite solid offensively. I'm still mad that I wasn't able to keep it up in regression. I don't mm. know if I made some faults with my planning or if it was just Simluck or the game plan Baylor was running for the battalion back then. But he massively underdelivered, um, especially in year nine. I mean, the defense was still there as a team, but uh, I think he could have won that point cut of the year easily if he would have just not sucked. <laughs> but uh, so it's not. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Maeda's chances of making the... Well, uh, you're a bad person to ask. Uh, well, I, I don't think he makes it. I don't think he makes it. He is right. just... Uh, even though he is in comparison to Bojack and the other classmate, I mean, if we all went nine or ten years, Bojack, uh, Washburn, and Maeda, um, 
he might be the only one of the three to actually win an award. Um, but it's still far from good enough to be in the hall. Maybe a second award, either with Colorado in the last season or with St. Louis, uh, could have tipped the scale. But even then, I'm skeptical when we uh, look at the competition we currently have. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to the next player, another player who played 10 years in the SBA uh, with seven teams, I think, um, which is a little weird. Uh, with San Diego, Toronto, Charlotte, Charlotte, Char, 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 uh, Houston, Brooklyn, Pittsburgh, and also with the Oklahoma City Rampage. Baby Shark. Uh, Oddly enough, a sort of a career sixth man type um, would have fit well in San Diego, where he was promptly shipped off from. But since in San Diego they like to play these little weird games with the minutes, uh, it didn't hurt him in Toronto either, uh, where he played 29, 26, 25, 25 sort of minutes per game. In general, Toronto yeah. wasn't better in that minutes regard. Yeah, no. San Diego at the time. No. Uh, well, uh, could be argued that San Diego is better with it now than Toronto is, but <laughs> that's for a different day. Uh, yeah, career averages of 28 minutes per game, starting 544 of 820 games, 16 points, 5.5 rebounds, 2.7 assists, 1.9 steals, 0 0.5 blocks. And a hair over 580 true shooting percentage. A career high in season, what would this be? Season 50 in Houston, where they won the championship for the first time. 609 yeah, true well. shooting. So, uh, That's also his sixth man of the year. Yeah. Yeah, once a sixth man. Yeah, once a sixth man of the year. A winner in season 50 which is yeah indeed like you said the reason why he's here uh, I don't think he will ever get anything resembling a vote uh, since he has the word is not maybe the worst player here of all who we've listed even though probably will be yeah I, I think like it's overall, between be. Lobo and <laughs> Shark and Steve. Yeah, like I would that. even throw Steve and Mata in there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Mata, of course. Yeah, I forgot about him. Not bad players, but uh, not the caliber of the rest of the ballot. Yeah. So I would be surprised if anything resembling a vote comes his way. But still, with the Sixth Man of the Year award, victory uh, has a place here, and also a two-time contributor to the SBA champions. Uh, we can skip the typical parts of the conversation here, but uh, what, what's just your memory and what do you think a Baby Shark brought into the SBA game as a player? Do you remember the draft in 45 and the whole thing around Baby Shark? Because as I remember it, he slipped to the second round in the end. Um, if I remember correctly, he wanted to be drafted to the Vipers and made it pretty much known around the league. Um, in the end, the Vipers didn't get the chance to pick him up with a second round pick or something like that. Uh, instead, the Corsairs drafted him, and I think he was quite unhappy with that, and that's the reason he was shipped up. Um, that's like my major memory, him slipping that into the draft shouldn't have. Just something to, of, about him wanting to play for a certain team. Just to clarify for, for the listener, uh, in the second round of the 45 entry draft, the Vipers picked second and third players, uh, Duncan Park and Richard Jones. And then with the fourth pick of the second round, the Corsairs selected Baby Shark. So either there's something missing here, or then. Oh, I Atlanta went the wrong team. Could also be. Uh huh. All right. So was it supposed to be BBD BB? 
New York. I know, but regardless, I, I anyway. don't know if I'm, if I'm mixing him up with someone else, but yeah, could that's be. My, my memory why he fell to the second round. Um, I mean, in the end, he was a, a decent two-way player uh, throughout his career. And in the end, found his happy place with Houston, Brooklyn, and then the young Pittsburgh squad. I don't know if that's the season they won, like, 70 something games 75 yeah it feels like it or would be disingenuous to say call it a young Pittsburgh team but no that was the season where they uh, first had sharp I think so 60 wins yeah I mean that's still still not bad so he contributed to, to the top teams for like four seasons yeah and I would say six I mean, Maybe Charlotte was not a top team, and maybe OKC wasn't a top top team. Charlotte wasn't in the playoffs. OKC oh no! Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah, yeah. So uh, I mixed them up in my head. Like I was thinking Charlotte in '54 and OKC yeah. in '49. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, that me. that would have been that would have been better. Maybe maybe you wouldn't have lost to the Bucks. Uh, but regardless, yeah, I think that's the ma- major point. So. Uh, I remember Shark. Yeah, I think Baby Shark, uh, as a player, uh, embodies the uh, what's been a criticism for a long time here, uh, where people seem like they would have no value if they are not earning the max or at the top three or in twenty-five DPS range of the top of their class you know what i'm talking about like if you're not a top earner and a max earner maybe it's a sort of a general consensus that you would have no value but yeah, yeah. baby shark i think is the embodiment of like where you have like maximum value for I hate to say lack of talent but lack of tpe since Shark was uh, the key piece for most of the teams, like you mentioned there, uh, played in Houston and was valued highly in Houston, then in Brooklyn, and not so sure about who was valued and who was good and was he meant to be starting in the end or not. And in Pittsburgh, a excellent player on an excellent team. Like... Um, I think he's the embodiment of what you can still achieve if you're not, uh, maybe don't have the best build or most optimized build or the most TP in your class. But also that uh, leaves you as the most expandable, uh, expand, ex, ex, expendable in your team each passing season, which goes to show with Shark being shot around and uh, let, being let walk in free agency, moving from Toronto to Charlotte, and then to Houston, and then to Brooklyn, and then to Pittsburgh, and then to OKC, like I said, seven teams in 10 seasons. Yeah, that leaves you to be the most most expendable, but still uh, highly valued in key situations and uh, on top tier teams. So I think Baby Shark should be a, uh, even for all the slandering I gave him at the top about Maybe not being, uh, maybe being out of place here on a Hall of Fame ballot, but still a role model for everyone who's trying to make it work with maybe not the best build or maybe not the highest amount of TP. Yeah, I mean, especially today, I think Sharks drive a lot more and they get a lot more attention. Um, back then, it was sort of like still at the heights of the credit drives and the massive numbers it brought in. So um, I think he was earning mostly nine for his career uh, because he didn't have a job and we still had the job cap in place. Um, But still dumped that he fell into the second round, especially since OD is not a complete stranger to the SBA world, even though he had been inactive prior to Shark. I won't name all the draft busts that came before him, but yeah, as you said, 
Let's just go. Model for anyone. Engel, Rose, Williams, San Sebastian, Mathis, Miller, Mino, Hooter, Murphy Jr., Tragmarty, Park Jones. Every one of them uh, would have been. I would say Park is like KTP. Yeah. After he went inactive. It's a pretty good haul for. He's also one of those guys that I couldn't believe that fell into the second round. Yeah. Because he was like super max earning and then just missed one week at the end. And yeah. all GMs were like, oh no, he's inactive, he's unstable. Let's take uh, some players I don't want to personally slander right now over him. Mm, yeah. Uh, but to Shark's credit, Compared to the, every one of those who I mentioned, uh, none of them are on the Hall of Fame ballot. So, <laughs> congratulations to Baby Shark on a, a fantastic career and a uh, much more better things to come with Brooklyn more deep, uh, as has already started, basically. Uh, who's up next, Nepto? Next, we got uh, another part time chief, uh, Alistair Takeda. Free time also, free time all defensive first team, one time defensive player of the year, one time power forward of the year, and one time rookie of the year. Yeah, uh, Alistair Takeda with four teams uh, in his SBA career, uh, like you mentioned there Colorado, uh, San Diego, Chicago, and then Vancouver in his later days. Also played, um, well, actually only played nine seasons in the SBA. But uh, a shooting guard freak? No, power forward center standard. Oh. So like the prototype of a two-way big man. Oh, yeah, Almost yeah. That was Colton Caesar. Say. Yeah. Excuse me there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Takeda with career averages of 26 points, nine, um, seven, whoops, seven rebounds, uh, 2.8 assists, 2.3 steals, and 3.3 blocks. Uh, like you said, they're a Defensive Player of the Year award winner once. Uh, played a lot during the time where uh, you had the players such as Monroe McMahon in the league, where it was a lot more difficult, so to say, uh, to win a Defensive Player of the Year award. Uh, known for uh, uh, the aforementioned amazing defense, and then in his prime, like the exact prime, in Chicago, the uh, the, uh, the final season in Chicago, excellent scoring. Uh, six 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 through shooting percentage in his uh, final season in Chicago in season fifty two, with twenty six point three usage and a really high rebounding rate as well, which brought him the Power Forward of the Year award. Do you think uh, Alistair Takeda, you, you used the word the prototypical there, but uh, it's not like uh, Joey invented the wheel there in season 46. When no, no, no. He, the... he is like the, the blueprint style of, of big men that we often see. Like, ex good, but nothing um, extraordinary. So it's like a, a pretty well-known build path, I would say. Um, I mean, we still see it many times today. The rookie of the year, um, uh, rookie of the year numbers are still quite uh, similar to some numbers we see today, and um, he expanded on that. Never was like top of the top in terms of blocks, for example, um, but had like that good and efficient scoring at all times and good defense, and yeah. Everything you expect when you hear two way big men in the SBA. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say, like, um, in today's SBA, you see players such as Grant Thompson and uh, Morgan Shadow Shield, maybe a little more polished versions of Takeda, but also in a much more favorable team environment uh, for all of Takeda's achievements, maybe choosing the team destination. Not so uh, clever in his career. Not sure. He was a GM player for Colorado, then was shifted. Yeah. During his inactivity, I yeah. think, to San Diego. 
And then, yeah. I think he, he was in the MVP contention during his time in Vancouver once, but uh, that was the whole Serrano, Cooper, Takeda teams, I think, where people were like, uh, aren't they all free in the conversation? Why should any of them be the MVP then? But, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's when... Um... Jeremy Bermi played in Atlanta, I think, the same season. Could be. Yeah, season 53. At least that's when they all three were excellent in Vancouver. Let's just take a look quickly. So, yeah, the team was Hector Fuego, Joe Cooper, and Ariel Marson. Let's start Keda and Solomon Serrano. Yeah, that's season there. Uh, what do you make of Takeda's chances of making it into the Hall of Fame or... Uh, are you still the wrong person to ask? I, mean, can, I can share my honest opinion um, without giving anything away. I'm honestly on the fence about him. Um, obviously, his trophy case is not truly stacked. Um, and he doesn't have like an all-time accomplishment list somewhere on there either because he was neither that proficient in blocks or scoring or whatever. Um, but I think he was still a pretty pretty good player. If he makes it over, let's say, three or four guys that are in the first ballot, I don't think so. But I wouldn't be surprised if he does sneak in over someone. Do you think he would be uh, more deserving of a Hall of Fame not than... Alton Caesar? That's a tough question. <laughs> uh, what about uh, him and G? I, I probably think yes, better than Caesar because um, he played at a higher level for his positional awards than I remember Caesar doing. No disrespect to him, but. Um, Sharing one shooting guard of the year award instead one of. One co shooting guard of the yeah, year award, and yeah. I don't remember him being pretty high on it for some other. What you while I remember Takeda falling short of that, like three guys, two, three guys that um, were battling for the power forward of the years at the time. Yeah, so, and one defensive player of the year award uh, compared to Caesar's none is uh, what about him and Chen, Jihan Chen, uh, which is more Chen like over Takeda, any yeah. day. Chen is, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is just to rattle out the landscape here a little. What about him and Freedom? Which do you think? Is it sort of comparable to Caesar? Um, I would rank Freedom over Caesar probably. Because even though he didn't make an all SBA team in the season later in one, um, I still think that he was unquestionably one of the best small forwards in the game and also first team worthy, if not for some other great performances. Um, so I see them pretty even. That's where I, where I say I don't think he's going to make it over that many of them. But yeah, at the same yeah, I time, see. Um, could, I wouldn't be surprised either if he makes it over someone like Freedom. Well, one last final wild comparison. What about Takeda to Boxman? That's how much you value um, career stability and career performance to boxman season and the meta impact it had in the end i don't know how, how do you feel about boxman because in my mind boxman is like this one great season that had such a huge impact and for Takeda, it's more the continuous excellence of his career um, well wouldn't that i I'm, I'm not so sure if that's apt what you said there, that it's continued brilliance through Takeda's career. I, I would argue that Takeda has uh, only a little more than one season at the top of the top. Like where, where he has the um, award-winning season in Chicago, then there's only the one season in Vancouver, and then the rest of it is just, uh, here's a guy who plays for Colorado. And for Boxman, maybe it was misuse of the general managers of his time, or maybe it was just that he was actually bad. 
uh, which I'm, like I said the last time, I'm still pretty torn on which it was. <laughs> was it that Boxman was actually bad when he left Arizona or was he misused? Not so sure. Uh, but yeah, Boxman only also has the one and a half seasons at the absolute top of the game. And yeah, the wild the comparison... Top of the game is not Takeda thing, but, but he was still like an all-star or slightly below all-star level in a stacked field of big men. So. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it like there's no comparable to Boxman during the time, maybe. Whereas for Takeda, there is easy comparables. Like you can say, like, what's the closest player, uh, what's the closest contemporary player to James Boxman? Then you maybe right have no of the his contemporaries. I would say I'm tempted to say uh, Ragnar is most comparable to to Boxman, but the two didn't really uh, meet up in terms of timelines. Mm. Yeah, whereas for Takeda, you can find three comparable players quite easily. This is what uh, I was trying to actually... I mean, there are three, three other top-of-the-game point guards in there on this ballot, one of whom we haven't spoken about yet. Yeah, it's difficult because I never thought of Boxman. The, the other three were like double-double machines with decent defense, decent to great defense. Um, that never was my view of Boxman. He truly embodied this like free point guardish nature where he switched around from point guard to. I think in Miami it even was powerful, just smooth. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, I think James Boxman is going to end up as one of the most underrated players of his time just because of the. For six and a half seasons, I moved him around in the death charts and thought, of, well, what the fuck is this guy doing here? Like. <laughs> why why does he keep getting signed? Why why is he being used? And then for two seasons straight he just wrecked everyone's shit and it was great. So maybe that's a little too much uh, subjective of a view, but that's my view, so <laughs> can't fault it. I think I would say Takeda is slightly more likely to make it into the Hall of Fame because of the career averages and uh like sort of a more standard accomplishment and accolades list, but I still think Boxman is a more intriguing case. Uh, like I would like to discuss Boxman a lot more than Takeda, where Takeda is on the bubble. He is quite bland. He's like, yeah. you know what you're getting. Yeah, Takeda is on the bubble Everyone of one knows. Yeah, who Takeda is going up against decides if uh, Takeda is getting in. Whereas for Boxman, he could either be like 75% vote yes, or then it could be 0% vote yes for all his time on the ballot. With, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, what I was thinking about with Boxman's uh, contemporary comparables was uh, like literally a player who sometimes didn't maybe start and was like, uh, sort of narrative wise also misused but then ended up breaking out when he went to a better situation but that's so rare anyways so maybe yeah I was about to say trying to think of someone anyways we're back <clears throat> um, and just a disclaimer to Nepto here we were back uh, the part where I just mentioned about Boxman we were also back but Ruined my own fucking joke. Anyways, uh, moving on to the next and the best player of all time in ESPN. No, actually, last time I said maybe he was the top three all time. It's, it's the same like with the NBA. It's tough to to measure people from so different yeah. uh, timelines against each other. Yeah, it's and, difficult to say who was... But- Best, uh, Jerry West, Larry Bird, or Nikola Jokic. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, don't forget Dirk Nowitzki in there. So. Oh, yeah. Or Luka Doncic, <laughs> he's the young goat. Uh, uh, yeah, just an aside, I hate the NBA Discord where uh, people, I'm not sure if they are doing it on purpose or not, but they sort of 
have this hidden racism thing where they only talk about white people or the white players. Like uh, Tyler Hero is my favorite player. Like it, it could definitely make sense. But when you have sixteen thousand people upvoting and commenting in a, it on Reddit and on Twitter, maybe sort of start to <laughs> uh, rack up the thinking brain there a little. But anyway, yeah. Uh, what did I say last time? I said maybe uh, Michael McRae, DJ Walker Santos, and. Uh, Who was the third one I had? Did I ever finish it? I think it was the first time when Tomato was on here. I maybe didn't finish it. We discussed the greatest SBA games. Yeah. Um, because we talked about Tim Goings, uh, Freak Sender, and Jaws being the... Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. For that. Mm. yeah, the best Freak Sender of... These times, no, well, anytime, since he's the only real notable one, as a fellow Hawkins was. Well, McMahon was also notable, but for different reasons, and Hawkins was a standard. Fellow Hawkins was no standard, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyways, uh, the next player is Walker Santos. Let's just read through the accolades and accomplishments. Seven times Simulation Basketball Association champion with the Houston Ravens, six time All Star. One time most valuable player. Uh, one time playoffs most valuable player. And um, just a minute. Yeah, one time center of the year, one time sixth man of the year. I was about to say, did he not have a sixth man of the year award win? And if he did not, yeah. that was a total snob. But. Uh, the list is like three pages long, so I just didn't see the sixth man of the year at the bottom there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of introductions here. Uh, ten years in the SBA, all with the Houston Ravens. Seven of them ending in a championship and uh, all ten in the finals, no? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's one uh, yeah, season... Season uh, the um, Real versus Vice. The last one. Yeah, the Real versus Vice thing. Yeah, uh, let me come not, back maybe one time. Bullets and Vipers also, but not Hall of Fame worthy at all. Let's see here. Uh, what a scrap! Yeah, what I a know scrap. The, the bullets. The bullets Vipers one was before. So yeah, every season they made the finals. Yeah, nine, nine, nine years in the nine of ten in the finals. Vice versus Rail was an aside. Yeah, cool, 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 cool. And that's not all of it. Uh, or do you have a correction still? No, it's it's just crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, career averages of twenty five point nine. 6.5 rebounds, 2.6 assists, blah, 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 who cares? Still above one assist to turnover ratio, so get shit on. Uh, two steals per game, three blocks per game, 2.7 personal fouls. Career average of 68.5 through shooting. And that's not to mention the 156 playoff games Ja played with almost identical career averages of 35 minutes in the playoffs per game, 25 points. Six rebounds, two point nine assist. Here he dips below one assist to turnover ratio. Who? Uh, two point two steals per game, three point two blocks per game, and dare to guess, Chaval Santos's playoff through shooting average for his career. I mean, I can see it right now on the. Uh, screen, so it would be boring. <laughs> Uh, write your write your guesses in the comments below. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the video, and press the bell notifications to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sixty four point eight is the answer for anyone who was wondering of uh, Ja Walker Santos's playoff career through shooting percentage average. Yeah. Uh, let's just rattle off a few more. Career highs of 55 points in the regular season against the Vice in season, which is this uh, season, 54. 
then 59 points in the playoffs against the Aviators on season 50. Wait, no, that doesn't make sense. In the playoffs, the it's yeah, yeah, playoffs 59. Playoff high was 55 against the Vice in season 54, and career high was against the Aviators in season 52. Uh, rebounds high 18, assist high 10, steals high 8, blocks high 12, field goals made high 25, free throws made high 17, three pointers made high 9. Wow, yeah, I, think, I think what's crazy about just even though you guys just heard all the accomplishments he had, um. But I know, I know the Neo users, as few of them as they are, um, who weren't around at the time, might be asking, why do you guys keep calling him the greatest player of all time? Yes, he won a lot of championships, but only has one MVP. Um, like Solomon Serrano had two, Grant Thompson is now going to have two. But it's tough to understand that Jaws was just dominating. I mean, you heard it nine finals, and maybe you can cut him some slack for those two or three seasons that he was in that dominant, but afterwards, he was fucking dominant and never played 40 minutes per game, because he didn't need to. And I think that that's something that might get lost if you hadn't been around at the time. Not only what you said, that you can't count out any of the seasons after his first one. Like, even in his second season, it was clear that he was, like, one of the better he offensive of players the... in the league already. Yes, for sure, and still had... Um, three blocks per game. defense. I mean, three yeah. blocks, 1.7 steals. Um, he already was good, but he wasn't as dominating as he became to be. Yeah, That's and my, uh, guess who won the championship that season? Yeah, they won the championship that season, four oh, yeah. row in the finals against Oklahoma City, I think. So, yeah, <clears throat> very difficult to count out anything. Mm-hmm. Like uh, everyone who's listening and would uh, raise any questions about this or in the future listening, uh, just go through the game logs of Javalker Santos' career, and uh, I think each season you can count the time times that he fucked up with one hand. Some seasons you can't count the times he fucked up and didn't play well because that didn't happen. Like it's also ultra consistency which anyone uh, who plays the SBA or is part of the SBA knows you can't do anything about it. Like there's nothing uh well I I I know for a fact that there are things you can do, like just build your player better and be- play on better teams. But anyways, <laughs> there, there's no bad games. or is, And is, if there is in the earlier seasons, you can count them on one hand. And in the playoffs, there's even less bad games because they always performed in the playoffs. Like, it's that simple. He never had an off day. Always killed everyone. <laughs> And uh, could, like, and his scoring profile was very similar to Joe Cooper, uh, where he was on great teams for a long time, and thus never had the chance to like blow up for a seventy-five point game or anything like that. But he could give you 40, 44, 43, 39 points each game, and then if the game was tight, nah, you'd see a. Little 54 here and there, 52 on 21 shots and 15 free throws, something like that. Like, it's amazing. I couldn't dream to make a player. Th- like, it's the same situation as with Monroe McMahon the other time. Like, I hope I would have noticed and made a player like this before it happened, but I didn't. And now I'm super salty and I'm just gonna stick to my shitty. Uh, uh, type of players that I make. Yeah, I think with Joss also, I think he has the most uh, seasons with over 70% true shooting in 
in SBA history, maybe McAdoo has also three, but I think he just has two and one of them is a bit higher than Jaws seasons, but like the level Jaws delivered at every season um, was crazy. And you just don't see him have 50 awards because the Ravens never needed him to be that. He always was. Uh, he was the first option more or less, but uh, not in an extent like a Thompson is taking the shots today. I think um, I'm just going to pull it up here just to bring it back to the little point you made there. McAdoo, four seasons with over 700 through shooting with the prime season of 734, but with one season less played than Walker Santos, still a lower career through shooting. So, hmm. I think it's even two seasons less played because I don't remember Mo going into regression at all. Or did he play 36 as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. I it's... mean, it's still, it's still crazy what I could do did back then. But again, yeah. it was a slightly different environment, which is why we usually don't compare them. Um, I just brought it up because it's extremely rare, even for the best scorers, to have a season above 70% through shooting and then even multiple in a row is uh, mind blowing. Yeah, just the of the past uh, 10 seasons, I don't even, like, aside from Jaws, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember like paying attention to someone breaking it if they did. Like I don't think uh, Grant Thompson is anywhere close to it. I don't think Malcolm Shadow Shield is like anywhere close to it. I don't think well, Magnus Ekstrom. Far from it. I don't think Magnus Ekstrom is anywhere close to. It. Like who are the other players? It could even be that Mark this is this year's true shooting leader, and that's a poor sight to see. Um, wait, let me pull up the playoff file. Surely in there, but yeah, I think Baramy might be the last. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe he had one. Let me check Baramy. What do you have? Sixty-eight point eight in Houston. That's another seventy. So we might even have Jaws being the last guy. Yeah, well, Zero. if you have it, yeah, yeah, if you have it open, you can just go to player stats, efficiency, and sort by through shooting, and see the players who started. Yeah. But I don't yeah, think. Yeah, this, uh, I'm looking for this season. Uh, Clark Steele the second is actually our shooting leader, with a phenomenal nine point four minutes played for the Charlotte Aviators over fifty seven games. Amazing. Um, the leader as non fillers. I count uh, Theo Thanos also as a filler because maybe he's inactive. Um, it's Leon Lundell with 67 points. And second one is Magnus Ekstrom. And if you want to know, the third one is Holly with 66.3. So, yeah. And 67.1 already is like a very good number, like an excellent true shooting mark. And that's 1.0 uh, fuck. Like uh, trying to use uh, American and European numerical formats both. Uh, if if Jaws through shooting percentage average for his career was 68.5 and McAdoo's was 68.4 and 67.1 is the best in SBA in season 59 and it is a very good uh, true shooting percentage mark already. Like, it's just, um, like, um, it's just like uh, Walter Santos was playing a whole different game than the rest of us in the SBA. Like, it wasn't even about the championships or the uh, scoring titles or MVPs anymore. It was just like maximizing the uh, output, which is uh, admirable, <laughs> indeed. And it had fantastic results, but I don't know, like uh, how 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 <laughs> how anyone can come up with something like this, and why is no one still able to replicate it, even though 
everyone in SPA copies someone else every time. Yeah, and you can also see the, the build path exactly and everything. Yeah. I mean, Houston's team makeup certainly help probably yeah but um, 10 seasons but still, it's it's always different it, each it, season it's, yeah it's mind-boggling yeah but thankfully we have k back now and who knows uh if calderon 2.0 is going to live up to the family name we will see yeah i can't wait for zion calderon to be a total piece of shit and retired in <laughs> five seasons time but alas, uh, I hope all the best for Kayfabe and congratulations on being nominated to the SPA Hall of Fame. Um, yeah, this is such a cakewalk, like there's no conversation. A top three player all time, easily, uh, arguably the best player of my time in the SPA and by proxy, arguably the best player of your time in the SPA. Definitely. Up all next... Right. Another one. Well, not last, but not least. No, it's not last. Oh, well, it is last. Yeah. Sorry. I thought there was some other sort of sea creature or something uh, below him. But Mason Washburn, a dear teammate of mine who I held back for not only one, two, three, four, or five. Oh, yeah. Actually, the number is five, I think. For five seasons with uh, freedom. Uh, Mason Washburn played from 45, season 45 to season 54 with, uh, let's just uh, check, I'm not missing anything, I don't want to say the wrong number. I really don't want to say he the wrong number. played for 10 seasons. No, te yeah, 10 seasons, I know, but I was going to say three teams, but there was indeed one Brooklyn Bullet season in there. So four teams, that's the number I was talking about. Uh, once an all-star, once a rookie of the year, very controversially, I must add, a rookie of the year, um, two times steals leader, once a all-SBA second team member, sixth all-time in assists with 9,237, 21st in rebounds all-time, second in steals all-time, although that might be under danger after season 59, I'm not sure. With 2,045, uh, 2,458, excuse me, 11th in double-doubles all-time and 8th in triple-doubles all-time. Yeah, um, with career averages of 12 points per game, 8 rebounds per game, 11 assists per game and 3 steals per game. Would you say Mason Washburn is probably not a player type or a statistical profile you'd expect to see on a Hall of Fame ballot that often? I mean, he is the embodiment of the utility player, if you want uh, to call it that. I think the best comparison, modern day comparison, is Michael Wallace. Um, great guys, good defenders, and the case of Washburn, one of the best uh, stealers of all time. Um, had a great great playmaking gene throughout his career and uh, helped a lot of high-flying teams even though they never won the chip in the end um, uh -huh, it was six seasons i held him back uh, but i get what you're saying he's not your all-around player that we're used to see like the sba is full of lebrons and those types that can do it great on both ends of the court um washburn was always limited in his score he was a great three-point shooter and uh, knocked down the few free throws he drew at a decent rate to not hurt uh, his team. But yeah, he's more like a utility and defensive player that we don't see that often on a ballot. But he did this utility part extremely good. And he's still second in steals of all time. Mm -hmm. Because you were wondering, um, first, obviously, is still Fuego with... 400 steals on him so uh quite a margin yeah but i was wondering about the who was coming up third but uh, players such as xavier may jones are already retired and i don't think there's anyone quite yet on the horizon right now of active players maybe Cerro miedo maybe miedo all the other two closest guys. Yeah, I think most of the old players have now retired. Like 
uh, what was bringing uh, or bringing down the salary cap among other things was that the a lot of people were going for longevity in the SPA instead of uh, starting the player after eight or nine seasons. But now most of the old players have retired, I think. Yeah, they have. Yeah, so there's Some no bad. one, no one uh, endangering Washburn's spot at second of all time as of now, I would say. But yeah, uh, I have a funny comparison for you. Uh, let's just look real quickly. Washburn entered the league in season 45. Season 45, playing for the New York Rail. For the Rail first. Yeah. In season 45, the Rail were 18th ranked in offense. In season 46, the Rail were ranked 19th on offense. Season 47, the Rail were ranked 13th in offense. And in his final year in New York, the Rail were ranked 14th on offense. They you try well, to actually, rub it into flex. <laughs> no, actually, I missed it already a season. On yeah, I already missed the season, so he went to the bullets in this season, anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, the point I was going to make here was that until he went to Milwaukee, uh, Washburn, as a point guard and as the orchestrator, was not really part of excellent offenses whatsoever. Uh, do you think that's just due to the Brooklyn and New York teams surrounding talent? Or do you think there was a theoretical ceiling to the uh, offense if you aren't just unleashing three-point shots after three-point shots like they ended up doing in Milwaukee and in Charlotte then afterwards? I mean, someone like Washburn, I wouldn't say there is a ceiling to him because I think it's pretty obvious. Um, the floor for someone like Washburn doesn't raise your floor. Uh, he's not the type of guy that carries your team on his back to a better record. But if you have some decent players around him, um, he raises the ceiling of your team. Because we mentioned how Jaws didn't do any mistakes. Washburn wasn't on the same efficiency level, but he kept his offensive touches to such a minimum, and especially the drives, which are uh, turnover drives most of the time, or at least usage drivers, which result in turnovers um, for guards. He avoided those religiously, and therefore he just gave the guys that were good at scoring their time to shine, and if you don't have someone that can score that well, then of course your offense isn't going to work. Mm. Because Washburn isn't going to do that for you. Yeah. Uh, or do, do you see it differently? Yeah, I, I would say I see it differently. I think Washburn, uh, for his impact on a good team, like you said there, with he makes good players great, but he can't make decent players any better than decent. Or bad players any better than bad. Uh, do you want to hear yeah. a little uh, funny nugget I pulled up here? In the sure. season 59, uh, who was the leader in turnovers per game in the SPM? Uh, Seth Valano uh, of the Rampage <laughs> with uh, five uh, turnovers per game. Um, uh, He's still with five. Yeah, care to know what uh, Valano's turnover rate was, uh, as in turnover... Yeah, I know the turnover rate is quite simple to, to Washburn. Yeah. Because that's, that's my main thing when people say build like Fuego or Washburn are like the turnover worst type of build. They don't cause turnovers, yeah, but, so they just avoid them for But if you really so think about it, yeah, turnover averse means they're actually ball averse. They're like yeah, they don't touch the ball, so they don't turn it over. Yeah, that that's that's like the thing. That, yeah, the, to the listener uh, who but... yeah, the, the listener who didn't get the point already, uh, Seth Valano's turnover rate, as in percentage of your 
um, finished possessions as an offensive player that end as a turnover is 15.4, uh, 15.5 for the season, whereas uh, Mason Washburn uh, surpassed 15.5 twice in his career. So for a turnover averse player, sure, had a lot of turnovers uh, in uh, like in relation to the time he, yeah, in relation to the possessions they finished. Yeah, but in the on the flip side, if you have like a major scoring player that usually, if they have a bit of handling, have a lower turnover rate than you, then this is a good thing because as a team you commit less turnovers overall because the player that has the higher turnover rate of the two, the main scorer or Washburn, um, isn't touching the ball as much. You know that that's why I think that he still ups your ceiling. He helps you as a team to commit less turnovers, but he himself isn't the one that's so great at avoiding turnovers. He just avoids the touches where he can make those mistakes. Oh yeah, I agree. And for a long time I said that uh, Washburn was better than players such as Bojack, Peanut Butter, and deserved more consideration in the All-SBA voting. But... Um, Yeah, uh, for like, example, it's more consideration when they don't have any volume to back it up. Yeah, like... yeah. Another point, uh, like uh, this, this wasn't meant to be like a devil's advocate thing, uh, as much as it may sound like it. But I think when I was playing with Washburn, I maybe overrated his talents somewhat, but uh, generally the public and usually. Like st then the public and now the public still underrated his talents somewhat. Like uh, for a career average in field goal percentage of 48.1, some might say uh, if, uh, that's uh, even for a point guard, that's really low. But when, let's see here, 66% of your field goal attempts are three pointers and your career. Like, I, I wrote an essay on this once for university, or college, not university, <laughs> anyway. Uh, for if 66% of your field goal attempts are three-pointers and you make three-pointers at a career 42.7% efficiency, then your true shooting is better than the league average in your position, which is capped up in two excellent seasons by Washburn. The first season in Milwaukee, where he had... 65.6 through shooting which for a today's point guard in the SBA season 59 would be considered like ludicrous and automatically would put you in award voting or award consideration and then his uh, second season in uh, Charlotte uh, Washburn had a 67.6 through shooting like you said there earlier, Lundell had the top through shooting percentage among all starters in the SBA in season 59 with 67.1. And he's 7 foot flat or 7 foot 2. 7 foot seven 4. Foot four. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So Washburn definitely was not like some would consider an offensive liability but possibly not all that so to say like not everything he was uh i among other people made him out to be at the time like he wasn't the best point guard maybe even of his time but definitely not all time but he was an excellent hand so to speak like, um, he didn't do much wrong at any points of the game, but also compared to players like you would see Alex Calderon, Eddie Donovan, players like that, they have similar efficiency numbers and even exceedingly high assist numbers and exceedingly low turnover numbers with 27 points per game with sort of high efficiency, like in the 640s, 650s. Maybe Washburn left a little something to be hoped for, like maybe you could have more in this slot, but it's always a personal choice when you make your player. If you want, just want 
high number of steals and a high number of rebounds, then you need to sacrifice elsewhere. And I think for Mason Washburn, the build uh, exceeded all those uh, parameters I said there. Like the player in totality was still an excellent player, but maybe at the time I overrated him a little bit. He's, he's still a great player, but I think he's not quite in the best point of all time, purely because he didn't produce anything. His efficiency is there, but just not the volume. It's like the same, you don't say a role player is the best uh, offensive player in the league just because he makes the few shots he takes, um, if that makes sense. So, yeah. If he would have decided to become a great offensive player like so many others did, um, and scored, let's say, 22 points per game in his prime. I think, Or even if he could have scored the 17 time. points through his career that he did in Milwaukee, something like that, like 17, 12, 17, 11, and yeah, that, 8 that to 9 rebounds, yeah. That would already put his career in a way different light than it is currently. But also, I think... Would he be the same player then? Would he yeah. Be raising the ceiling. So it, it's purely a hypothetical. Yeah. yeah. Also, if I now just want to play the devil's advocate a little more, uh, did he raise the ceilings? Like, uh, no finals appearances, I think. Or one. Well, you've, been, you've been with him to the finals twice. So. Oh, twice. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was thinking about the let's see here why so I'm pretty sure that, that that he made the finals twice oh yeah yeah finals. yeah because season 52 <laughs> also they, yeah they yeah, yeah. Were on. <laughs> mm, I forgot about season 52 like I, I forgot I made the finals oh, then you forget that one um, yeah to yeah be I... honest. I, I forgot I made the finals that year, so it only makes sense that I would forget Mason went the finals that year. Anyways, uh, so yeah, that's a moot point then, because uh, I I don't want to, like, I'm just going to mute my microphone for six seconds here for the recording. you yeah i don't agree with this one um but yeah anyways <laughs> yeah yeah back live back live here <laughs> so yeah once i got that off my chest now that we can actually talk about the great achievements of mason washburn uh do you think his best season was the season in milwaukee where it was just like like in retrospect i kind of would compare it to the like golden state warriors type of like you know, playing with joy and just yeah, but I do beep that boop. I was there, then I was here, and then they just shoot three pointers. And Jihan Chen has a 61st double double of the season, and Monroe McMahon has 17 blocks again, and they win 61 games, something like that. Do you think that's the best season, or do you think Charlotte seasons maybe even uh, are more impressive in the end? I would probably say Charlotte's the better numbers are in Milwaukee. Um at least from a volume standpoint. I mean it's the highest points per game and I think even the highest assists per game season and still free steals. But I think that Charlotte was this better season. It was the closest he came to a true triple double average. Um he still had was among the best guys exists per game. He laid up maybe only 13 points per game that season, but as you mentioned, insane efficiency from free. Um, and I think that that's put, that pushes it over the top for me. Yeah. Like his most complete season, even though the, he didn't have the same um, volume as playing next to Monroe McMahon, because that's another play that refused to take shots. Yeah, and then also then that season you had a starting power forward was Mike St. John, who was 
or actually like uh, Jack Straw. Who took, yeah, like Jack Straw. Or, yeah. Was it the one with what? With Willie and yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was Willie. Jack Straw. Yeah, right. Harlem was the season before, and then Willie was the last one uh, before it all broke up. But yeah, Jack Straw took a little bit more shots, but also Freedom on that team then was forced to take a lot of shots and Freedom was not good at making any shots still. So like a lot of the 17 points per game and 9.6 rebounds is possibly just a matter of circumstance and team build. And uh, I maybe overstated it there a little bit. Uh, I said 61 wins, I think. Let's see here. It was more like 50 wins yeah 50 wins flat not 61 wins for the maulers in that season but yeah i i am in unison with you that the charlotte season in his uh, peak of prime was like it was probably what propelled washburn to be a hall of famer in general or like uh, on the ballot for the hall of fame in general because yeah you have six assists all time and second steals of all time but if you're just like a player who plays 12 season and averages 10 and 10 and 2.9 assists. Is that something to write home about? But if you have like the two or three seasons where you're actually like considered to be having the first or second or third best point guard season in the league, that really propels you up in the like all time categories as well, don't you think? Yeah, yeah that, that's. That's exactly my, my my train of thought as well. Yeah. As continuously good as Washburn was, it felt like he stopped at a certain level and had those short short uh yeah, sp- sprints where he was like excellent from three point land or whatever. But um it's nothing that blows you out of the water when in comparison to someone like McGrady, for example. Which is obviously a pretty harsh comparison. Yeah. Slightly difficult there. All right, we've gone for one hour, 17 minutes now. Uh, do you think you'd like to do just a little five minutes talk about the upcoming season 59 playoffs, or should we move that just uh, to next week or later this week as a playoff review? I mean, we can just do five minutes of, of predictions and then. Yeah. All right. Just uh, have to be careful not to ramble on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think Washburn and uh, Walker Santos and Maeda and uh, to a slightly lesser degree Takeda and to an even slightly lesser degree <laughs> Baby Shark deserve a little bit of our time because we cut it short previously on the. But, anyways, um, uh, another question I'm going to have for you here. Uh, should I have like a set, like, can we? Can I send my award ballots for the SBA and SBDL like when we do the next podcast recording? Like maybe we can do the award voting for me live. You don't need to, but maybe we can do the whole discussion for both leagues sort of live on next week's podcast. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So sure. it's I mean, not too late. I'm until until the end of next week. Week, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's not too late if we do it next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that. I think so. Let let me check again. What the? I mean, we have no set. Yeah, up usually I send them eight, like eight. on off season weeks Friday. So I figure off season weeks Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Should yeah, we be have until well. January the twelfth. So yeah, yeah. All right. So let's do that next week. And yeah, just uh, quickly here pulling up the playoff brackets for season 59. The Wolverines have a bye, the Vice have a bye, the Maulers and the Ravens on the other side of the bracket have a bye. So as the Maulers didn't finish the season unbeaten, as we very strongly predicted at the start of the season, they still uh, ended up with a bye there. Uh, do you just a uh, little quick tip there? Uh, Wolverines, Vice, Ravens, Maulers, uh, any of them surprise as a buy for you or just... Uh... I mean, still still a bit surprised. There. Um, Which didn't one? expect them to, to be this good in the end. Vice. But... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Vice, yeah, yeah. 
Miami B champ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe we will see. I I still think they're the weakest of the group. Yeah, uh, I think if the Rampage beat the Ocelots in the first round, the Rampage could also beat the Vice in the second round matchup. I, I don't think that's all too unlikely. Uh, whereas uh, Engine is a total nerd, which is good in the SBA. Don't get it twisted. Uh, being a total nerd, uh, I think the team talent uh, is uh, somewhat comparable to the OKC team talent. Uh, the rest of the first round, who yeah, didn't... I yeah. think it's a different team matchup. That's like... Yeah, it, it is different. Yeah, it is different. But I, I, I would say it's close. I would say it's close. Yeah, it's close, of course. Yeah, the rest of the first round matchups are my and your Charlotte Aviators. Uh, who famously took down the Brooklyn Bullets the other year and sent old balls into retirement. I think, at least. Chaka is not around anymore. Yeah, it, it was Chaka's last season. Yeah. Since then it's... Happy retirement, number two, Chaka, if you're listening. Um, yeah, yeah. The Charlotte Aviators against uh, the Pittsburgh Ironmen. Uh, winner of that goes to play the Wolverines. Yeah. Then, like I mentioned, Rampage, Ocelots, winner of that, goes to play the Vice. Vipers, Thunderbirds, winner of that, goes to play the Milwaukee Maulers. And then at the bottom of the bracket, Prowlers versus Inferno, winner of that, goes to play the Ravens. All right, let's, let's do it in this form. Uh, do you foresee, if you had to simulate, like, just... Like eye out the bracket. If you had to simulate it in your brain, uh, do you foresee any uh, upsets in terms of seeding? And then, uh, what's your finals prediction with the result? I mean, you mentioned already. If if I see someone beating a buy team, then it's either the rampage taking down the vice or the vipers taking down the maulers. I don't think. That the Vipers uh, are going to be stopped by the Thunderbirds, um, but I could see them take care of the Maulers there. Otherwise, Ravens are going to be in the finals, and probably the Wolverines. Um, maybe Charlotte or Pittsburgh can put a fight up against the Wolverines, but I don't see the other three teams stacking up as well. Um, yeah, and the Ravens, um, they're still my favorite to win the title, just like last season. Still have the best defense in the league and Grant Thompson on their side. So I don't know if you, you can see a team that's going to stop them down there. I think it's just fighting to be the second one in the semifinals against the Ravens in the yeah. bottom bracket. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give myself a lot of room to look clever here, but I have a few different suggestions here. Like I, I have some that are likely seeding upsets. Uh, Iron Man beating the Aviators. Uh, Vipers moving on and then beating the Maulers. Inferno beating the Prowlers. I can see all of them being quite likely upsets. But then I also have a whole tier for like underdog story sort of stuff. Uh, Aviators making the finals of the SBA. Iron Man beating the Aviators and the Wolverines. That's that's something to look out for. Uh, then Vipers beating the Mol uh, Thunderbirds, Maulers, and the Ravens to make it in the SBA Finals. That's a spicy one. I just like sort of saw through here. I find it very likely, but uh, like uh, as an underdog story, I think there's something to it. The Vipers team is a lot better, I think, than their seeding give them credit. Not sure what happened there. Or uh, then I... They had a great year, but uh, just one step behind the rest. So yeah. Maybe I, I misjudged I their talent, or maybe I was entirely correct with the Arcetolis Salaminos thing I said at the beginning of the season. Like, that's not a championship level point guard. Then. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe they can uh, make the Silva Taylor... Started point guard. El Malini started shooting guard. Uh, Congo started they can, small they can forward. Flip a lot of those guys. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I think yeah. Bass played at a position for two sims in a row. At least yeah. it felt like it. Yeah, I would. If I was in charge of this team, I would start Salaminos at small forward and give a filler 
with max three pointing three point shooting minutes off the bench like literally minutes off the bench like like two <laughs> not ten but like two and yeah also a uh, final sort of a weird under underdog story I have here would be the Wolverines winning the SBA championship that's uh, not as spicy but as with their history in Vancouver that would be an underdog story would be I would great say for Jeff to finally win one no fuck yeah. Jeff uh, it's the players like I don't get it each time I'm that uh, the iron men are tagged about something it's me like I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not the team. It's the players who make the team. I'm not even on the team. I'm on the aviators. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, for all the work course, Jeff yeah, puts in, like, yeah, for like all the Jeff all is the only one left from those last finals teams. That's yeah, why yeah. I think. Yeah, for the work Jeff puts in uh, into making the best team he can possibly make. Yeah, obviously it it, it is fantastic to see some success alongside it, but. That was just an aside of if if someone tags the Iron Man, like mentions the Iron Man, why am I the one tag? Like uh, it's definitely <laughs> Cassie who's <laughs> the spirit and the like face of the team, not me. <laughs> or it's Rauta Persa with his new swanky graphic uh, signature. Anyways, yeah, my final prediction. Um, Yes, I'm just gonna go with Wolverines, Ravens, Ravens winning six. That seems par for the course. My uh, hot take finals prediction is Wolverines against the Vipers, Wolverines winning four. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, any any finals that doesn't include the Ravens is a hot take. Um, my hot take would probably be the Aviators against... Uh, yeah, against the Vipers, probably, if you're going to real hot take, uh, more realistic aviators against the Ravens. I think the upper bracket is a bit more open uh, than the bottom bracket. Yeah, I could also see but the Ocelots just... making the semifinals sort of easily. Like, not easily, yeah, easily. They but could make the semifinals. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they would beat a Wolverines aviators. No, or I, I don't think. Yeah, games. I don't think so. They are too limited in their play style. But yeah, but the, the top top half of the bracket is shopping. indeed that one. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I wish we had another one hour and twenty seven minutes to talk about the ways that we would try to beat the Ravens if we were the Vipers or the Maulers or the Wolverines or the Vice or the well, actually, you are the Aviators and I am the Iron Man, so <clears throat> that's a moot point. But we don't, and. Uh, the few minutes we allotted for this playoff preview has already turned into around 10 minutes. So with that, we bid you adieu. Uh, we as in me and thanks to Nefto for hanging out once more and giving us a lot to talk and think about the Hall of Fame nominations for the new season. Maybe one day we will start leaking them straight ahead. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we could we could leak the results already, but yeah, it, it's been fun talking, especially thinking about players who have already been mm -hmm. retired and have been my my introduction to the SBA more or less. Yeah, uh, if you want, uh, if you want to have a little bit of like excitement in the podcast, I can not go and double check that the, my microphone was muted when I mentioned who was getting into the Hall of Fame, like off air. So maybe there's a little bit of an Easter egg who listens to all the way through here, but I'm pretty sure I had my mic muted because, uh, yeah. Anyways. It's confidential stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a professional podcaster now with almost a year's worth of material. So I'm not prone to making mistakes such as this. Uh, well, I guess we'll see you all again next week with my award ballots for both the SBA and SBDL and maybe even Nepto's award ballots. Suppose he'll have yeah, voted probably. by then. Or you can just guess it and off what I respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or maybe if you filled them out already, maybe you can give counter arguments to whatever I have going so we can actually like have an adult conversation about who has and who doesn't has it. Anyways, thanks everyone for listening.
Yeah, that's the pretty rare on the internet. On the SBA, boo, boo, Who boo, wants that? boring, boo.